They call me deranged. The hope is that they are right. It is of no greater or lesser import for another fool to wander the earth. But if I am right and science is wrong, then may the Lord God have mercy on mankind. These are the words of Victor Schauberger, a man born over 100 years ago into his role as a guardian of the earth. Among the magnificent Austrian forests, he grew up wanting only to become a forest warden like his father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and his father before him. But life was to take Victor far from the peace and solitude of great mountains and forests. Instead, he was to lead the struggle to preserve the earth, the forests and rivers, attacking the exploitation of nature as early as the 1920s. Nature was his teacher. Through an understanding of nature's principles, seen in the flowing motion of water, he gave the world a vision of how technology could be transformed to render free, non-polluting energy for our use. He warned of the consequences facing humanity if the present death-oriented technology continues. He died, betrayed by the same powers who promised to make his dreams a reality. Commercial gangsters who take all and give nothing back to the world. When a man dies, the bell tolls. When the forest dies, and with it a whole people perishes, not a finger is lifted. It is known that for the death of a people, the death of a forest has preceded it. All across our planet, the forests are being destroyed at a frightening rate. From the Amazon to Sumatra, from Siberia to Australia, from Alaska to California, the great virgin forests are rapidly vanishing, the victims of logging, acid rain, and drought. Only 50 years ago, this part of California was a vast primeval redwood forest, truly a paradise on earth. Today, less than 4% remains, and every day, more of these ancient giants are felled. Even our national parks are dying of atmospheric pollution. Soon, nothing of nature's beauty will remain for our children. It was in such a paradise that Victor Schauberger spent his childhood at home in the forest. Even the family motto, faithful to the silent forests, echoed the deep respect the forest wardens once held for the trees. From an early age, he was a keen and astute observer of nature. He learned directly from nature, closely studying the relationship between the earth, the trees, and water. But water, the lifeblood of the earth, became his consuming passion, and he set out to discover its laws and character, to learn the secrets of its power. Far from being merely an inorganic substance, Victor perceived water to be alive, and with its own cycle of birth and transformation into higher forms of energy. He spent hours studying the flow of the natural waterways, how water moves in characteristic patterns, how water currents become stronger in the early hours of the morning when it is coolest, and particularly during full moon. He recalled the stories passed on from his ancestors who utilized their knowledge of water to transport logs down from the high forested mountains. They built constructions down the mountainsides, which made the water flow in serpent-like spirals. I knew that my father transported hundreds of thousands of cubic meters of beechwood over long distances, never, however, during the day, but at nights and generally when the moon shone. The reason for doing it this way, as my father often explained, was because water exposed to the sun's rays is tired and lazy, 
and therefore curls up and sleeps. At night, however, and especially in moonlight, the water becomes fresh and lively and is able to support the logs of beech and silver fir, which are in fact heavier than water. By the end of the First World War, Victor became the wildmeister for a large wilderness area of almost untouched forest. But his employer, an Austrian prince, had problems. He needed money. He needed a way to transport timber down from the remote forest lands. It was Victor who solved the problem of transportation, building water chutes or flumes based on his own observations of water flow and the knowledge of his ancestors. Through observing the movement of a water snake undulating through the dam beside him came the key to his success with the flumes. By imitating its movements, a combination of horizontal and vertical curves, the water chutes carried the heavy logs effortlessly. A patent for the artificial channel for transporting logs was granted in 1931. It enables heavy logs to slide through specially designed double concave channels without becoming jammed. Experts came from all over Europe to study the constructions and Victor was offered a position with the government. Ironically, it was the success of Victor's invention that opened up the previously inaccessible high mountain forests to commercial exploitation. He was forced to witness the brutal damage inflicted on the land he loved by short-sighted greed. He had observed how the streams reacted when the trees were cut down. When a mountain spring is deprived of its natural protective shade and exposed to direct sunlight, it dries up and does not begin to flow again until the shade is restored. Some mountain springs disappear, never to return. It is a fact that our supply of mountain water is shrinking as the protective forests are being thinned and cut down. When the mountain slopes are bare, rivers turn into thin trickles or dry up completely. Or when it rains, they become raging torrents, bringing floods and devastation. The waterways become blocked with silt and debris, destroying the vitality of the water and choking the lifeblood of the earth. Combined with the damming and regulation of rivers, this begins the vicious cycle of drought and flood. Here's some soil from the forest floor, still underneath the trees. Very humus rich, it's a very alive soil. In fact, it can still sustain life. Here's soil that's left over from logging and general human habitation in the forest area here. See it's very hard and stony. Nothing really grows in it here, uh, except maybe some bracken ferns and what have you, um, maybe some desert.